Well, I uh, trust you have your Bible with you tonight. Let's look at Luke 23, if you would. Turn to Luke 23. As you find your place, somebody wrote one time, forgiveness sounds like a marvelous idea until you're the one that has to do it. <laughs> sounds great. And we know what reveals really the worst in each of us. It's the pressures and the anxieties of life, the stress, the stuff of life. We can say all we want to, how solid we are as a Christian, how fruitful we are as a believer, but really the problems and the stress and the, pro and the, the God-ordained circumstances, the fire, the stuff of life is gonna reveal what's deep down inside of our hearts. And this brings us to Jesus Christ on the cross. And what I want us to see, and, and more importantly, here's what I believe God wants us to see, is the heart of the Savior, the heart of the Savior while he was in the most intense, stressful, pressure-packed moment of the universe, hanging on the cross, dying for our sins. And here's what you will see over the next several weeks about the heart of Jesus. He has a heart of trust, trusting in his Father. We're gonna go over that tonight, where he cries out, Father. That's a heart of trust, trusting God, even when life hurts. He has a heart of compassion. He has a heart of love, a heart of forgiveness, wisdom, knowing exactly what's going on. He, he knew why he was there. He knew what was going on. He understood the dynamic of people's hearts. He knew why they did what they did and why they are saying what they're saying, why they're responding the way they do. There's wisdom there, but there's also this, and this is often missed, there's an other's focus. There's a focus on other people and not on himself. Typically, when we're treated unjustly, and let me ask you this tonight, how many of you have at least one time in life been treated unjustly? Okay, all of us have. Typically, when we're treated unjustly, and I am not quite to the point yet when I'm treated unjustly where I can say, praise God from whom all blessings flow, that that's my first response every single time. Typically, our flesh starts to conjure up emotions of ungodly anger. Why is this person doing this to me? How'd they cut me off in traffic? Why aren't they responding to my text? Or maybe somebody treats you unjustly and a lack of others or a lack of a love for others, uh, we want to lash out at them. We want to get them back. They said something unkind to us. Well, I'm going to tell you this. In my arsenal of unkind comments, I've got about a three to one advantage on them and I'm going to get them back with my words. Maybe complaining. The Bible uses that word. The Bible also uses what I think is a, a more powerful word, Philippians 2.14, you find it in the book of Exodus, all throughout the Bible, really, grumbling. Have we ever grumbled before? There's grumbling that, that conjures up and surfaces in our hearts. Sometimes even questioning God. Like, God, do you really know what you're doing? Are you really all wise? Do you know what you're doing with my life? Maybe revenge, scheming in our hearts how we're gonna get back at someone, longing for justice. Here's the big idea with tonight's message. Jesus' death on the cross makes his prayer for forgiveness possible. Because of what happened on the cross, we talk a lot about forgiveness. Praise God here at McGregor, we sing a lot of songs about it. We remind ourselves of the gospel over and over again like every single service. We talk a lot about forgiveness and a lot about testimonies. Think about like these baptisms that happen. People don't stand up and say, I'm a really good person and I think highly of myself and God is so grateful I'm on his side. Now I wanna get baptized. And I heard somebody say this one time, the church is the only place that in order to join, you have to admit first that you're bad. You have to admit you're a sinner. You couldn't join McGregor Baptist Church if you didn't first come clean and say, I'm a sinner and I have completely disobeyed God and I've gone my own way and I'm trusting in Jesus Christ alone for my salvation. And that's why my sins are forgiven. Let's look at this passage here and think about this. Think of the heart of Jesus and think of his heart. And I want us to think of our hearts tonight 
which for me is tough sometimes because I don't always like what I see in my heart. But let's ask God in Luke 23, we'll begin in verse 32, to reveal our hearts to us so we can confess, we can turn, and then we can grow and change into the image of Christ by the power of his word. Let's look at verse 32. Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him in the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments and the people stood amazed by, and the people stood by watching, and the ruler scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. I want to pause there. Luke, the book of Luke. Why is this in your Bible? The whole book of Luke. And the longest book, I believe, in the New Testament. Why? did the Holy Spirit inspire this? Luke, known as a doctor, Luke, known as a very thorough, detailed historian, wrote, you find all this, all this back in chapter one, to a man by the name of Theophilus. And he's writing a detailed count, account of the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ. The most detailed of all of the Gospels has the most parables. It gets the most detail of Jesus' young life, his birth. But not only that, it's very detailed in trying to put to rest any arguments that Gentiles would have against who Jesus is. He wanted to make a very strong case. This is the Christ, the Son of God, the one you must believe in, and this is who he claimed to be. So I believe as Jesus is praying this on the cross, he is fulfilling a messianic prophecy about him found in one of the most in-depth, specific messianic passages in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 53. In verse 12, it says this, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. And that brings us to this account. What does this teach us about the heart of our savior? First one is this, if you're taking notes. The heart of our Savior is trusting. He's trusting. Take a look at the text again, and I want you to look at verse 34. And Jesus said, Father. He cries out to his Father. Now notice, he calls out to him, and picture the scenario. He's been beaten. He's been flogged. He's lost a lot of blood. Undoubtedly struggling to breathe. He's physically weak. Not only that, there's the mockers all around him calling him all kinds of names, lying, blaspheming him as he's hanging there on the cross. And he's placed between two legitimate criminals. I mean, these guys deserved what they were getting. And if we're not careful sometimes, we think our sin is not that bad. And what contributes to that line of thinking is we forget about the holiness of God. We forget how holy God is. And when I forget how holy God is, I forget how offensive my sin is to him. Here's two criminals who are totally guilty. One man, the God man in between, who's totally innocent. Completely perfect. According to John 8 verse 29, he always did the things. This is Jesus saying this. I always do the things that please the Father. Now if I say that, I'd be hypocritical. Because I can't say that, but Jesus could, and he did, because he always did what pleased the Father. And in another passage, he talks about this. He talks about the fact that he could have ordered down legions of angels to rescue him from that very moment. In fact, in Matthew 26, verse 53, at his trial, he said, or do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. Now here's the deal. In his deepest moments of despair, Jesus knew why he came to die. He knew that. And it's important in our deepest moments of despair, where is God in this? How is God at work? Why would God do this to me? And what's God's end game with my life? 
So think of the words of Jesus in Mark 8, verse 31. He knew he was going to die. He knew this was going to happen. And it says this, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Now can I ask you this, those of you who might know the Bible well or, or maybe just even uh, somewhat casually or tacitly, did Jesus say that several times? That he would die? That he would be beaten? And that he would rise again from the dead? So the cross did not surprise him. Didn't surprise him at all. He knew exactly what was going to happen, why this was going to happen. And a true heart that is trusting in our Heavenly Father does so even in the most intense and deepest and pressure-packed moments of despair. And that's what God will do to us. He will bring about the pressure in our lives to show what is right here. Who do we really trust? Who do we really treasure? Who are we really looking for or looking to for our satisfaction? Which means this, we don't take matters into our own hands. We don't try to play God, but we can trust in him. We can trust in him. Here's what you find with Jesus, entrusting himself to his father. I'll look at a passage in just a moment here that specifically gets into this. So when you're persecuted and you're mocked and you're misunderstood and you're slandered, and by the way, let's just ask this question. Do those things ever happen to Christians? Are they happening to Christians around the world right now? now this is friendly here. I'm, I'm, I'm like home field advantage here. This is great. I'm with Christians who love the Lord. You pray, you believe the Bible, you love the Lord. And you love each other, you encourage each other, you look forward to church. I'm gonna look forward to church. I love church here, this is great. It's, it's a great thing, but there are brethren around the world right now that when they do the very thing you're doing, they run the risk of their lives. And their families are mocked and persecuted and under enormous amounts of pressure because they love the Lord. And I often wonder in my own life, and. Uh, the numerous mission trips God has, has given me the, the wonderful privilege to be on for my wife and I, when we go to places where it's tough to, for people to open up places for even a church to meet, and they make it difficult for churches to congregate, and they do everything in their power to make it difficult for Christians to worship or even get Bibles into their country, I look at that and I think, how would I respond if that were me? Because, yeah, I've been persecuted, I've been mocked, I've been made fun of, especially when I first became a brand new Christian. But I've never gone through that, what Jesus is going through right there. And when I read the book of Acts, I don't think I've gone through that. And when I read the Apostle Paul at the end of 2 Corinthians 11, I know I really haven't gone through that either. How would we handle that? So when you're misunderstood and you're mocked and you're persecuted and maybe even your job's on the line because you will not deny the Lord and you will not embrace ideologies that reject the Bible, that, dear friend, is when we can entrust ourselves to our Heavenly Father just as Jesus did. Entrust yourself to him. Let these words that the Holy Spirit inspired to Peter to write. Let these words encourage you and help us understand how we are to be more like Jesus and to follow in his steps. And what exactly does that mean? You want to jot these verses down. 1 Peter 2, 21 through 23. 1 Peter 2, 21 through 23. Now listen to these words. For to this you have been called. Time out. How many want to do the will of God for your life? You want to do that? How many want to know that what you're doing, you're called by God to do that? Okay? All right, so think of this. For to this you've been called. Ready for this? Because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Now I want to pause here. I don't know a lot of people who want to sign up for that, including myself. I like comfort. I like air conditioning in cars. 
I like walking into rooms and turning the air conditioner down and nobody knowing that I'm the one who did it. Isn't that a blessing? I know a church in Indianapolis where the pastor built a brand new auditorium and did something very brilliant. He put a thermostat in the back of the auditorium and people would just you know, get up and adjust that and adjust it and they thought the temperature was changing. They thought it was changing. It was a fake thermostat. The real one was way in the back. <laughs> and I think a lot of us, you know, we'll do everything we can to be comfortable people. Nothing wrong with comfort. You have what you have because of God and God's blessings. And God is so good. And so every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from above from the Father of lights in whom there's no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So it's all from our good heavenly Father. But we're also called to this, to suffer. Now listen to these words. He, Jesus, committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. I'd love to be able to say that about my life. That word entrusting is a super powerful word in the Greek. It means literally casting everything you have on him. He entrusted everything to him. So Jesus hanging on the cross, truly God, truly man, people calling him names. I'd be tempted to say, well, you know what? I know like three times more things about you that are really bad. And I got this and I've got power right now to get at you and I've got this and I could, I got this on you. What did he do? He entrusted himself because there was a bigger purpose and that was to die for our sins and to become sin for us. So he cries out, Father. And remember this, Jesus' death on the cross makes his prayer for forgiveness possible. So the whole idea of God being our Father is a very New Testament teaching. And Jesus introduces this in his prayer uh, in Matthew chapter 6 and all throughout the New Testament, throughout the Gospels. So let's think of this. The heart of the Savior is trusting. Now, here's where we're going to spend the most amount of time. The heart, the second thing we're going to look at, I only have two points, but that does not mean they're going to get out early because the second boy is really long. So <laughs> the heart of Jesus is also forgiving. Let's look at these precious words again. Let the word of God speak to you tonight. Look again at verse 34. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I want to pause here and let those words resonate. Some of the most moving and heart revealing words of scripture. Let's ask some questions of the text. You always want to do that. You want to wrestle with the text. I'm all for Bible reading plans that get you through the Bible in a year. Uh, some of you might read your Bible through twice a year. That's awesome. Praise God. But I also firmly believe the more I read the Bible, the more I understand that uh, I've, I really need to soak in what I'm reading. And I don't want it to be so much about checking a box as I want it to be about probing my heart. And in order to do that, this might get me through the Bible a time and a half, twice a year, once a year, praise God. That's wonderful. But I really want to make sure scripture is resonating in my heart and I'm not just getting through it. And in order to do that, it's important, the book of Psalms talks about this quite a bit, to meditate on the word. Think of the word. Let it resonate in your hearts and think of these words, Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. Now let's ask some questions of the text. Okay, what exactly is Jesus saying here? And what do his words mean? And what do they not mean? Ask yourself this question. Is he unilaterally forgiving those who are mocking him? Is he unilaterally forgiving them? I don't think you can accept that because you know God's forgiveness is conditional upon repentance, upon faith. Okay, so, and the text doesn't tell us here that people are repenting. Now, I want to ask another question here. I'll jump back to that. We'll go to that. And I want to ask another question. Who is Jesus focusing on right now? Who is he focusing on? Yes, sir. I think it's the soldiers pouring, pounding the nails. In. Okay, could be that. The Jewish people. Jewish people. Or every, all of them. Yeah. 
Yeah. How about this? How many would agree Jesus is focused on others? He's focused on others. He doesn't, I don't see him saying this. Okay, I've, I've read this a few times and, and maybe I've missed it. I don't think I have though. I don't see him saying like, man, life just stinks. Look at the people. If I had better people in my life, I'd have better circumstances. If anyone could say that, it'd be Jesus. Okay? It's not what he says. What you see here is a manifestation of two of the most convicting verses in the Bible that I read, Philippians 2, 3, and 4, the mind of Christ. The other person is more important than yourself. I think that changes the dynamic of every relationship we're in. They're more important than me. I must consider their interests above mine. The mind of Christ is not necessarily being a brilliant theologian. It's simply being others focused for the glory of God. That's what it is. I'm more focused, we must be, on others. And he's focusing here on their greatest need. Forgiveness against a holy, holy, holy God. And when we see it that way, we no longer excuse our sin. We no longer say, my sin isn't that bad. We no longer say, well, I'm not as bad as the guy over here. A recent survey I saw, and I forgot who actually did the survey, it was a few years ago. It said like 90% of the American people believe in hell. But like nobody thinks they're actually going there unless it's Joseph Stalin, Adolf Hitler, or Osama bin Laden. Like nobody thinks they're the ones who actually deserve to go there. And Jesus here on the cross focuses on their greatest need. So what exactly is Jesus saying or doing here? This, friends, is a prayer. He's praying for them. It's a prayer for who? For sinners. A prayer for forgiveness. A prayer that God mocking, God rejecting, sinners in darkness, sinners in deadness, sinners in deception, sinners in blindness would come to the light of the knowledge of the truth in Jesus Christ. He's praying for them. This is the interesting thing about our lives is that we all know we're going to die. We all know that. But what sparks curiosity in each of us is we just don't know how that's going to happen. How, when, what the circumstances are going to be. We don't know that. And that sparks in each of us some sort of curiosity. Images maybe of a deathbed come to mind. Um, where we physically can't do what we used to do. We all have different fears, you know, like uh, when is there going to be a day where I just, I can't work anymore and, and I won't be able to mentally do what I do now. Or maybe like the memory doesn't work anymore or the mind doesn't function anymore. And, and that, that kind of scares me a little bit. You know, I, I can't say that I'm such a faithful Christian to where that doesn't cross my mind and cause some sort of fear in my mind. But think, many think like, I'm gonna reach an age where I can't do anything for God anymore. I'm not gonna be effective. I'm not gonna be useful. And I just wanna tell you this. I've witnessed numerous people on their deathbed, especially as a pastor, who have incredibly effective ministries even on their deathbed. To nurses, doctors, family, unsafe family, as they handle death with trust, and joy, and an other's focus, and a focus on God and others, that sort of mindset. And here's Jesus, and it looks humanly speaking, this guy's gonna have no effect whatsoever. But even in the darkest moments of despair, he is still having an effective ministry, is he not? Even on the cross, his words are having an impact because words always come from somewhere, Luke 6, 45, and several other passages. Where do our words come from? The heart, 100% of the time. So I cannot ever enter into a context where I say, that just wasn't me who said it. Uh, then I look at passages of scripture that tell me, yeah, Mike, it was you and your heart that said that. And it came from your heart where those words 
came from. I can't, I can't put that on anybody else. It's my responsibility. And again, let's, let's just circle back to the beginning of the message here. What does this say about the heart of Jesus? So, a few things here. He is not unilaterally forgiving them because that's not how God forgives. There is no such thing as a person who has had their sins forgiven who has not repented. Biblically, you cannot get there. And there is no such thing as what's called universalism, where in the end, God just forgives everybody. Biblically, you cannot accept that. That would be, I want you to say heresy with me at the count of three, ready? One, two, three, heresy. You can't accept that, okay? You cannot accept that in the end, God forgives everybody. God's forgiveness is conditional. On what? Faith and repentance. Listen to these words. I'll give you just a few verses. Let me just explain or just expose apostolic preaching in the early church age. Acts 3.19. Listen to these words. Repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. Listen to Acts 20. Verse 21. More apostolic preaching here. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. There is no other way. And to that, all God's people can say, amen. amen. Okay, so forgiveness is conditional upon faith in Jesus Christ. Let's dig into the weeds a little bit here. Let's look at the word that Jesus uses here for Forgiveness. The most common word is, is a Greek word, aphiemi. Okay, I may be saying that wrong. I don't think you're going to lose any sleep over that. But it's a word that simply means this, to release from legal or moral obligation or consequence. So when God forgives, it, it's popular, I know, to say this, that, well, God just forgets. Well, to say that would be to say that God is not omniscient. And God does not forget, here's what God does, he chooses not to remember, or he chooses to not hold that against you when we come to faith in Christ. So, when God forgives, he commits or he promises that he will no longer hold the sin against the person being forgiven, why? Where were their sins paid for? At the cross at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith, I received my sight and now I'm happy all the day. Especially when the bears and cubs win, amen? <laughs> so it's based on the condition that a person owns up and they repent. Turn a few pages back to Luke 17. I wanna show you something here. Jesus is going to talk about this in the relational context and this is gonna be tough. It's tough for me to see this it's tough for each of us because right now, when we talk about forgiveness and we talk about hurt and we talk about relational complications, there's no doubt images are coming into your mind right now. People, situations, uh, real hurt. And it might even be a live situation right now in your life. And let's just be convinced tonight that the word of God is real answers to that. And God's grace is sufficient even for relational difficulties. And we could say, this situation's too big for God, or we can humble ourselves to the fact that my God is sufficient for whatever I'm going through right now. And his truth may not make sense to me sometimes because I, I don't think correctly about everything. But God is not the one who needs to change. I am. And I need to submit my will to his. So Jesus here is going to talk to his disciples about what they are going to need to hear and what I'm going to need to hear. Look at verse three of Luke 17. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And notice the clause here, there's a caveat here. If he repents, forgive him. Oh, good. Well, let's get a little deeper. And if he sins against you seven times a day, you can reach number five, and then it's okay not to forgive. Is that what it says? No, you know that. 
And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent. Now these are the words of Jesus here. You must forgive him. Wow. So he says before this in the first two verses, rest assured, offenses are going to come. How many of you at least one time in life have been offended? All right, it happens. Now, let's, let's, let's kind of put it where the rubber meets the road here. How many of you at least one time in life have offended other people? Good night. Yeah, we've all done that. And we don't like to brag about that, but we have. So biblically speaking, how are we going to follow the principles of God's word and seek reconciliation? So let's think about that word repent, because this is important to understanding the context of Luke 23. Remember, let's scripture interpret scripture here. So to repent biblically is the Greek word metanoia, change of mind, change of heart, change of direction, but specifically the mind. It's a complete change of thinking and an attitude. Now, it's not an emotion, but I'll argue this, truly repenting does bring about some emotions. And I think like remorse, like, oh, I've offended God. And you know, I've, I've really hurt a lot of people. This, this was wrong. I've hurt people with this. Maybe hurt my wife, maybe over the top with my children and I need to ask for forgiveness. Or, or maybe a church member, uh, maybe, Maybe in your life you're thinking of something right now where you've needed to do that. But there's also this. I would say there's joy. Is there anything sweeter than a relationship that's reconciled? Isn't that a wonderful thing? Like, think of a context even of church discipline. If you're a member at McGregor, you know this is taught in the membership class, thankfully, because it's scriptural, it's biblical. And think of when someone who is astray comes back to God on God's terms and then they're reconciled with God and they're reconciled with others. What a wonderful, sweet thing that is. And you think of a passage where biblically that's illustrated beautifully? The prodigal son. He comes back and the dad's not like, oh man, here he comes again. What does he want from me this time? And sadly, as Christians, sometimes I have to guard my heart because I can think that way sometimes. And I don't want to think that way. I want to think God's grace is sufficient. The blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse of all sin. Amen? Amen. And there's no place so deep where the grace of God will not go deeper. And, and so the Father is like celebrating. There's joy. And you find in verse 7 and verse 11 of Luke 15, there's joy in the presence of God and the angels over how many sinners who repent? One, one sinner who repents. So there's, there's emotion involved. I think there's even relief that's there. Like, yes, there's freedom. Yes, I'm forgiven. I've come back to God on his terms. I've come to him on, on what he expects of me. But at the core of repentance means to turn in actions and attitude and Christians must always forgive the repentant just as God forgives us. What does this mean in interpersonal relationships? Because we could never talk about forgiveness of each other if God had never forgiven us. So what's the model? Ken Sandy in his helpful book, The Peacemaker, it's a little bit older book, but super helpful in dealing with interpersonal conflict. He gives, and I can give these to you after class, I, I should have them up here, but Four promises based on God's forgiveness. When we forgive someone else, someone comes to us, they, they own up. It's not, I'm sorry, won't do it again. That, that's not a real confession. A real confession actually, I believe, names the sin, recognizes the hurt involved with it. Like, I sinned against you, X, Y, and Z, whatever I did. I hurt you with that. I'm, I'm, I'm truly sorry that I did that. Um, I've confessed it to God and I want to confess it to you because I love you and your relationship is meaningful to me and I believe you're a gift from the Lord. Will you forgive me? Now, how many of you would see a difference between that and saying, oops, I'm sorry, I won't do it again? The world runs from culpability. It runs from any kind of personal responsibility or anything that the Bible would allude to as guilt. But scripture 
really shoves personal responsibility into our hearts. We are responsible before God, and we're responsible before him. So let me give you these four promises. Uh, a couple of weeks ago in my senior Bible class, we spent a whole week on forgiveness because if they're going to have fruitful relationships in life, they got to understand this. All of us have to understand this. It's difficult. It's tough. A lot of people don't want to talk about it, but man, I'd want to talk about God's forgiveness all day. It's such a sweet subject. So the first promise is this. I will not dwell on this incident. I think that's the hardest promise to keep is not to think, not to dwell, not to constantly meditate on it. And I would encourage, and I'm, and I'm speaking to myself here as well, when you've been hurt and there has been forgiveness, there's, and I'm gonna talk about the difference between transactional and attitudinal forgiveness in a second here. But when there has been forgiveness that's happened transactionally, I would encourage you to pray and pray and pray that your thoughts would be taken captive to the obedience of Christ, 2 Corinthians 10, 5. Memorize verses about that, that God would take your thoughts captive, that you not dwell on this in a way that just constantly is on your mind and, and put off that and put on right thinking as Ephesians 4 talks about. Second one is this, I will not bring this incident up again with you and use it against you. I often use this illustration. And we don't have snow shovels here in Florida, but we did up north. So I'd always say, take the shovel, put it away, throw it away, put it back in the garage and stop using it in every argument that you have. These, these arguments people have. You know, well, I remember what you did. How is that fruitful for a relationship? How many of you are grateful God has not done that to us? And he doesn't do that to us. Well, remember, Mike, on June 2nd, 1983, when you were nine years old, what you did? Uh, no, I don't remember that. And I'm thankful that God has washed it pure under the blood of Christ. And when he sees me, when he sees you, if you know Christ, he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Third one is this. I will not talk about it with others. I'm not gonna talk about it with others. I'm not gonna gossip about it. Uh, I will only have in the circle those who be relevant to it. And I can get into that later. And then number four, I will not let this relation, this incident rather, sorry, stand between us or hinder our personal relationship. So I won't dwell on it, number one. I will not bring this incident up against, uh, again to you. I'm not gonna talk about it with others. And I will not allow it to hinder our relationship with each other. Now you might respond with this. You're not saying it, but I, I can just hear this. Well, shouldn't I just forgive whether they ask for it or not? And here, I'm gonna give you an answer on this, and I'm not compromising when I say this. My answer would be yes and no. Let me explain. I'm gonna to explain to you, it's explained differently with, with different people. Pastor Russell and I talked about this a little bit. I use the word attitudinal forgiveness, that there's an attitude we have where we're praying. Someone's hurt us and they've not, they've not asked us for forgiveness. And it seems like they don't care. But we have an attitude of prayer. And in fact, it is Jesus who said, pray for your enemies and pray for those who despitefully use you. And, and we pray and we have a heart that's willing to forgive. Just like the father with the prodigal son, he was willing. And if you remember in that parable, what Jesus talks about is the son was willing to go back to the father on his terms. Okay, he was humble about it. He owned up to his sin. I've, I've sinned against you and against heaven and I've, I've done wrong. I've wickedly sinned. And you're praying for your own heart. You pray for the other person and you stand with open arms ready to forgive, wanting to forgive. You're longing for that to happen. I would call that attitudinal forgiveness. And the second part would be transactional forgiveness. It's when the other person owns up. They confess. They ask for forgiveness. And God commands you to forgive that person. Now, look back again at Luke 23. Let's look again at the text we're considering tonight. The first saying of Jesus on the cross that we'll consider this evening. There's two criminals. Look again at verse 32. Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. Now, did they actually deserve what was happening to them? 
Yes, yeah, they, they did. I mean, our sin, no matter what it may be, it deserves death. And James 2.10, if anyone keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he is guilty of all. So we've all fallen short. Okay, now look again at verse 33. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, where they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left, and Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now look at the text. There's two other criminals next to Jesus. One, you'll find later in this same chapter, he would be forgiven. He would be forgiven. Now, now why would that be? Because he humbly confessed Jesus. He humbly cried out to Jesus, the thief on the cross. I want to recommend a book to you tonight. This is a super helpful book. Um, it's actually written by a pastor friend of mine, uh, Chris Bronze, Unpacking Forgiveness, Biblical Answers for Complex Questions and Deep Wounds. If I were to cover all of this, uh, we would be here till next Wednesday night. And I think you probably want to eat and get some sleep and work and do a few things here and there. But I would highly recommend this. Uh, he wrote this as he was going through a, a very difficult time, uh, went to pastor a church plant and uh, went through a hurtful time, he and his family. And I could not recommend this book enough. This is, I believe, the most, one of the most comprehensive books biblically on forgiveness. So I'd highly recommend this. Chris Bronze, Unpacking Forgiveness. I'm gonna quote him here, what he says about this very passage. He says, isn't it true that Jesus forgave those who crucified him? Some will, some will object. The short answer to that is no. Jesus did not forgive them. If you think carefully about this passage, you will see this is the case. Jesus prayed for those who crucified him that they would be forgiven in the future. He did not thank God that they were already forgiven. If they had already been forgiven, such a prayer would have been superfluous. Now, I want you to listen to Erwin Lutzer, longtime pastor of, of Moody Church, now retired, uh, well-known author, theologian. He also gives some insights, wise insights into this passage. He said, could God have forgiven those people without their asking to be forgiven? No. The prayer was not for those who did not want to be forgiven, but for those who would seek it. Nor was this a general prayer, giving a blanket pardon to all those involved in the crucifixion. This was a prayer for those specific individuals whom God would save. Now I wanna take a time out here. How was that prayer answered? Well, I wanna give you some specifics with this. I want you to think of the centurion, Matthew 27, verse 54. When he uttered the words, truly, this was the son of God. I think that's a confession of faith, quite honestly. I think that's what that is. He was so moved by Jesus. He says, truly, this was the son of God. I want you to think of Jesus, the last night of his earthly life, in his high priestly prayer. In John 17, verse 9, he says, I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those, there's a specific group here, whom you have given me, for they are yours. I want you to think a short time after this, nearly a month and a half, on the day of Pentecost, where both Jews and Gentiles would come to Christ in huge numbers, multitudes of numbers. And it says in Acts 2, verse 39, Peter preaching. Now, who would have thought about a month and a half before this that Peter would be preaching? But Peter preaching, one of the most powerful sermons in the history of the church, says this, for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, every wo everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Verse 41, so those who received his word were baptized. Notice they received his word first, then they were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Wow, that's amazing. I think in a very real sense, that prayer was answered there at the day of Pentecost. It could be, I will not say this definitively, using a tad bit of conjecture here, could it be there may have been a Roman soldier or two on the day of Pentecost who came to know Christ, maybe, 
text doesn't tell me that. But it'd be really cool if that happened. We get to heaven one day and we find that out. That'd be awesome. Jesus is praying. I want to think again about the heart of Jesus with this. Hanging on the cross, what do his words reveal about his heart? I'm going to give you some takeaways. First one is this. Jesus leaves us an example of how we should pray for those who hate us and, and hate the Savior. Are there people in this world who, who hate Christians and hate the Savior? How should we pray for them? We should pray for those who are guilty of the most heinous of sins. God can forgive them. Uh, think of the Apostle Paul. It is a trustworthy statement and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm not as bad as other people. He said, of whom I'm the worst of all. I'm the worst. I think we've got to constantly look at ourselves objectively in the biblical mirror of what God says about us. And never lose hope. Keep praying. Keep praying. I'm going to give you another key takeaway from this. Jesus also demonstrates the power of prayer. Think of how God answered this prayer in a powerful way, I believe, on the day of Pentecost. Using Peter to preach one of the most powerful messages in the history of the church. There's, there's a real power in prayer. When we think of prayer, let's not think of checking off a box. Let's think, I pray because I really need God. There are some things God commands me to do today I cannot do without his help. I've tried doing it in Mike Hess's power. I fall flat on my face every time. I really need God. God commands me to love my wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Husbands, is there any husband here who would say, you know, God, I, I got this one, man. I'm good on my own. This is a real easy one. How many husbands here would say, you need to pray to do that, right? How about where God tells us to love your enemies? Do we need God's help to do that? How about God's call to be holy? Do you ever plead with God, God, help me to be more like Christ. Help me to be holy. I need your help with this. Help me to love people. Help me to really, truly love them. Help me to encourage people. Help me to go out of my way to encourage them. Help me to be others focused. I, I pray, Lord, help me in my conversations that the other person will be more important than me, that I take an interest in them. Help me to pray for the nations of the world that I really have a concern for souls and that people would come to Christ. Does God answer prayer? Absolutely. Let's be people who are known uh, for prayer. We're quick to pray. I had a pastor when I was a real young man who... Like, everywhere we were, like, I could see him at the grocery store. I'm like, hey, Mike, how's it going? Good, yeah, hey, let's pray right now. Yeah. We're here in the, like, grocery store. I hope we're not in the liquor aisle, you know, that's right next to the ice cream, but good night. I was, like, thinking, you know, we, he just prayed, like, all the time, everywhere. And that's why we should be quick to pray. Quick to pray. Just real quick to pray. Have you ever been guilty of this? I have, where we, we will say, I'll pray for you. And it doesn't exactly happen. That's if we're quick to pray, we make sure that actually happens. We, we have integrity behind our prayer life. Also, Jesus teaches us that even in the midst of intense suffering, we can still minister to others. We can still do that. I don't know how many cancer patients I've known who've been an incredible blessing to me. Those who've lost a child, they bless others because they demonstrate Christ-likeness in the midst of their trials. Those who are going through a financial difficulty, they bless others as they demonstrate a bedrock trust in God. Think, in intense suffering, we can still minister to others. The, the one thing the enemy wants to do to us when we're going through the intense stuff of life is to become very inward-focused. Even when we're suffering, God commands us to bless others to be an encouragement to others, uh, to look to serve others. Another takeaway would be this. Jesus exposed the foolishness of the human heart. The foolishness of the human heart. Notice these words you find in Luke 23, and look again at verse 34. For they know not what they do. They're so foolish and so in darkness 
They, they have no idea. They, they're, they're nailing the Son of God, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the resurrection and the life, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, who was and is and is to come. They're nailing him to the cross and like gloating in it. Like, wow, look what I'm doing, man. This is so awesome. That shows the foolishness of people's hearts. And I want you to think for a moment in your own life, if you were not connected to the grace of God because of the grace of God, what kind of foolish decisions has God kept you from in your life? If you were left to your own, your own strength, your own thinking, your own power, what foolish decisions would we be making in life? And, and I believe Jesus' words expose the foolishness of the human heart. This world is in darkness, and it does what it does. So I, I just listed a few things here, like stealing, murder, extortion, adultery, mocking God. I could go on and on because they're in darkness. And we need to share the good news of the light of the world with them. We need to be that witness, but not just living it, but telling it, sharing the gospel with others. That's their only hope. God doesn't tell us to go make people smarter. God tells us to go share the gospel. Tell them about a crucified and resurrected Savior. And this, last thing, last takeaway. Jesus lived what he preached. He lived what he preached. He told his disciples, love your enemies, pray for your enemies. He does that. When I was an enemy of God, God sought after me. A.W. Pink wrote this, above all others, Christ practiced what he preached. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. He not only taught the truth, but was himself the truth incarnate. Jesus perfectly exemplified everything he preached. What a savior, amen? amen. What a savior. Jesus' death on the cross makes his prayer for forgiveness possible. And if any big takeaway, we learn about the character of God tonight, our God will go to great lengths to save sinners who are really lost. And that was me and that was you, not because we're good, but because our God is so good. 